Good morning. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. My name is Travis Shaddix. It is Valentine's Day 2024. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I'm wearing red, but it might show up as orange. I don't really know how it shows up on screen, <laughs> but it's, it's a red shirt in celebration of Valentine's Day. I hope everybody's doing well. We uh, have been going over nitrogen, and we're going to continue to go over nitrogen nitrogen today with a very um, easy to understand article. It's very interesting. Hang on, one, one second. Um, so it'll be it's a fun article today. I like straightforward articles. It's a newer article. It's only ten years old. So look forward to that today. Good morning, Connecticut. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> Cuban and Dominican. So Cubanican. So I guess I'm saying that right. Louis Castellucci. Sounds Italian. Today's paper is from a journal in Europe. The editorial board has a lot of Italians on it. I, I think the journal is based out of Germany, I think. I'm not 100% sure about that. It's a journal that I've never actually published in, and it's not a normal journal for turfgrass science. But um, it is in it is in it it is in Europe. I just don't know exactly what country. Wayne, good morning, turf nerd. Right in the middle of your Zoom meeting. Well, you know, work comes first. <laughs> this will always be on YouTube, so you can come back to my me later, or on the, any of the podcasts. So. Yeah, Chuck, you have a comment about a comment that you left yesterday. I do have it here on my email or on my yeah, on my email. Whenever you comment, it sends me an email. And I can't explain it why the comment doesn't go in the video. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I it happens five or ten percent of the time I get a comment. Well, any comment you leave sends me to an it sends an email to me. But five or ten percent of those never get posted on the video. I have no clue why that happens. It's not. It's not me. At least it's, I'm not doing anything intentionally. Not that I know of, anyway. Um, but I did get your comment. I'll I'll reply to that. Um, I, it sounds like maybe I already answered your question, mate. Perhaps Chuck, but I, I wasn't a, when I read through your your comment or question. I wasn't a hundred percent clear. So I'm going to come back to it and look and look at the video again and see exactly what I said. If you need further clarification on that, I'll do it. I don't know. Next time I'm on, I suppose. Uh, Randy, Bulgaria. We said we may have Italy. No, we have Bulgaria. We have a lot of international, an international audience here. Now, Andrew says my shirt does look orange. Yeah, I think there's a filter on my, on my broad, on my videos or my camera or something that turns it a different color than what it actually is. Okay, so you're from New Jersey, Lewis. Good to know. Good morning, Chad and Lush and Turf Nerd. Yeah, Turf Nerd. So it says that you'll check in since you have UMAX and it fits today's stream. So yeah, if you're using UMAX or UFlex or any stabilized nitrogen source, uh, Mondays, actually the, the episode last week, Dr. Soldat Night, discuss stabilized nitrogen you might want to go back and check that too if you haven't watched it and then all this week we're doing stabilized nitrogen so monday we went over it yesterday we went over it today it will actually be including both components so it'll include both a nitrification inhibitor and a urease inhibitor in this one it, it is uflex i think what is it yeah uflex so this article contains the product with the brand name Uflex. So it's not going to be any different than yesterday or the day before or the day before that. <laughs> just, just so you know. So if you want to go back to your Zoom meeting, basically the results are in this paper, the inclusion of Uflex provided. And this is the reason I'm including this, this, doc, this paper because it's so great the way they say it. It, 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 it applied no value whatsoever <laughs> to the turf grass. It, it, it provided no additional benefit whatsoever. And the way the authors worded in this document is, is a genius. It just, I just like the way they say it. So I'm including this. 
Um, real quick, so if you have any questions, a lot of people are sending emails and great and comments, and that's all fantastic. Keep keep them coming. If you want to make sure that I hear it and I respond to it, I highly encourage people to use the voicemail. It's 859-444-4234. Anything that's left on there sends me a text or sends me an email, lets me know that you left something. I'll go through those and accumulate those. But just keep in mind, anything you, you uh, post on there as a voicemail, um, I'll probably use it on the show at some point. So if you don't want to be identified, then just don't say your name or something. Um, but I will, I'm, I'm relying upon that because there's so much information coming in at this point. I just can't keep up with it all. And so anything left on the voicemail is very likely to be addressed and you'll make sure it'll be for certain that I get it. Also, don't forget for, there's been several people uh, last week. There's uh, some people this week that have been using the Calendly.com services that I provide. It's a service that uh, if you want some input or second eye on your program or some, I don't know, a different different viewpoint or whatever you're looking for on your fertility program for your turf grass, whether it's golf or lawn, saw production. There was a saw. I was on the phone yesterday with a saw producer, uh, sport fields, whatever it is. If you just want a second eye to look at it and see if you're doing what you, uh, you know, what you are doing is as efficient as you can make it. I'll do my best to, to do that for you via calendly.com slash Travis Shattuck. So if we go there, you don't have to um, even ask me about the schedules or what times are available. On Calendly.com slash Travis Shattuck, all my times are ava- that are available are on there. It's connected to my Google Calendar. You can't see what all's what on my calendar, but you, anytime something goes on my calendar, it removes that time slot as an available time slot for you to choose to meet with me. So you can go on there, select anything that's on there in, in terms of available times. And we'll sit down and go over whatever it is you want to go over. Soil tests or nutrients or fertility or whatever the case is. Um, so don't forget that. If that's something you want to take advantage of, please consider it. Okay, so as I said yesterday, about an hour into the show usually is when my voice starts to go out. So I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit <laughs> so I don't <laughs> lose my voice. But this article today is entitled response of turf grass to urea based fertilizers formulated to reduce ammonia volatilization and nitrate conversion by henning branham and mulvaney and they're in illinois i think yeah they're in illinois and this was published again in a journal called biology of Fer- biology and fertility of soils I- i'm not particularly that familiar with that journal I believe it's in Europe, and the only reason I mention it is the confidence I have in articles that are published in the Tri Societies or the Hort Societies or Weed Science Society, anything like that, is pretty pretty high from the beginning. It may change after I read the article. It depends on the article, but I don't really have a whole lot of skepticism usually about the articles that are in there. There's several articles in there that are horrible, believe me, but for the most part, the vetting process, the refereed process that the articles are um, have to go through in order to be published are pretty firm. They're pretty strong. So in order to get in there, you have to pass, you know, quite a few hurdles, reviewing and, and you know, other people making sure, editors making sure the content is is accurate and so forth. When you go outside of those societies and get into other journals, I don't have the same level of confidence as I do with the the articles that are in those journals. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean they're any less valuable or anything like that. Just I'm not real, I don't have the same, I, I, I read those articles with a greater skepticism because I'm not really sure the, you know, the value. So for example, anything in POS, Public Library of Science, I have no, virtually no confidence in until I read the article and I have to really read through it and have a lot of skepticism and, you know, understand what they did and how, you know, everything really has to be meticulously reviewed and with a great deal of skepticism because a lot of the journal articles in that journal are junk because there's not the review, the review process in that, that journal in, in turf grass science 
is nowhere near to the level in crop science and so forth. And so it's re- I refer to that as a, as a predatory journal. They're open access. They're preying on faculty members and people that want to publish, and they're, they're, they're pay for service. So you got to pay to get your journal, your article in that journal. And so they'll, they'll, they'll just crank through the articles, preying on junior faculty usually because they need to get their articles in. They need to get their CV pumped up. They need to get these numbers built up for tenure and promotion, and they'll just publish wherever they need to publish to get it done. But in so doing, they end up getting taken advantage of in some journals that are referred to as predatory journals. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this one is. I don't even know this art journal. I'm just letting everybody know that I don't know this journal. I don't know the content or the, the, the vetting process and the refereeing process. I don't know it. I've never published in it, and I haven't read a lot of articles in it. So I'm just saying that to say that I would be careful by just pu- by um, publishing and saying, okay, this is what this journal found. This is what this article found. Therefore, it's absolute truth. I'd just be careful about that until you have a little bit more confidence. This impact factor is a six or a seven, which is two or three times higher than crop science. I think crop science is like 2.5 or 2.4 or something. It's, it's, it's not near that number. To give you an idea, the very, very highest science art journals, science and nature, they'll be in the 40s or 50s and even some of the medical journals would be in the hundreds 150 i think is the new england journal of medicine i can't remember now but they're very 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 high agricultural journals don't get anywhere near those numbers they're usually in the twos and threes this journal is six or seven nothing wrong with that it's fine the higher the number the better so the impact factor gives me an indication that it's it's highly cited but you can't rely upon that to to have to immediately have confidence that the, the content is sound, I guess is the way to say it. So, so I'm just saying that to say this, I don't know this journal, let's read through it and, you know, see what, see how it relates to past publications and, and so forth. And by the way, it's going to relate exactly to past publications. <laughs> That's the reason it's in here. It's funny. Okay. So response of turf grass to urea based fertilizers formulated to reduce ammonia volatilization and nitrate conversion. If this, I believe this article is actually you have to pay for it. It's not free, so you'll have to. If you want to read it, you'll have to pay for it. But you can read the abstract for free. In the last sentence of the abstract, it says, "Though the efficacy of urease and nitrification inhibitors has been demonstrated both in the laboratory and for row crops, inhibitors appear to be of limited value for enhancing nitrogen use efficiency in turf." How many times have you heard me say that? You know, that's what I've said. That's what Dr. Soldat said too. I think it was last week. I mean, in row crops, it's pretty, pretty well documented that they function well and they result in greater yield. But in turf grass, they just don't. <laughs> and the last sentence of his abstract says the exact same thing I've been saying for weeks. So you can go and see that for free. You don't even have to download the whole, the whole article. You can just read the abstract for free and get a general idea of what they found. But we're going to read the we're going to read through we, most of this is um not I'm not going to read through most of this let's see here yeah there's you know I don't know a fair amount of it we're going to read through the green parts the highlighted parts and you're welcome to go and download it and pay for it and you know and get access to it and read the whole thing if you want to the introduction urea is the most common nitrogen source for turf grass fertilization I, I thought for years that it was DAP I thought. In general, it was diammonium phosphate was the most common fertilizer. But I looked that up, and apparently they're right. Urea is the most common fertilizer, even outside of the United States. So that's, you know, I mean, it makes sense that urea would be that way. But DAP generally has a very, very high volume and in, in usage in the, in the United States, but for ag. But regardless, they're right. Urea is the most common. This, popular, this popular <clears throat> popularity reflects the same attributes that have made urea the leading synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in, the world, in world agriculture. Low cost, high nitrogen content, chemical, st- chemical stability, ease of handling, and water solubility. The main drawbacks arise from the limited period of urea nitrogen availability for plant uptake and from the risk of nitrogen loss from ammonia volatilization, nitrogen, nitrate leaching, and denitrification. So... That's their, that's their case, is that it's very common. Urea is very popular. It's highly used due to its inexpensive um, and the high, high amount of nitrogen. And, but the drawbacks are 
there can be great great amount of volatilization gaseous loss either through that that process or through denitrification and there can be nitrate leaching from the use of soluble urea i mean for the most part that's true volatilization loss losses can occur when urea is hydrolyzed to ammonia and carbon dioxide by the ubiquitous enzyme urease which has numerous plant and microbial sources under turf grass culture, these losses have been attributed to elevated levels of urease activity, which were reported by Torello and Werner in 1983 to be 18 to 25 times higher for Kentucky bluegrass clippings and thatch than for the underlying soil. So ure urease is, is impossible to escape from, basically. Even in virgin soils, even in, even in gassed soils, where the soil has been quote-unquote sterilized, it won't take very long for that soil to be repopulated by microbes and by urease. Maybe a week or two, month at the most. You're going to have a um, repopulation of that sterile soil. So urease, urease is everywhere, and that's what's required. That enzyme is required to convert urea to ammonium. Okay, And they're saying it's everywhere, and it's higher in the soil. I mean, I'm sorry, it's higher in turf grass clippings and the thatch. 18 to 25 times higher than it is in the soil. Okay. In turf, urea nitrogen losses via volatilization have been reported to be as high as 55 to 65% by Volk in 59. Losses will be much lower if urea is incorporated into the soil profile by rainfall and irrigation. So this Volk paper, I mean, I could go into it in 59. But these values of 55 to 65 percent is oftentimes what you'll find on on marketing sheets to scare you into thinking you're losing all your nitrogen and you have to have this product you have to have the urease inhibitor to reduce that volatilization so that the plant has more nitrogen and if you lose 65 percent of the nitrogen from volatilization you only have 35 percent left you put on a pound now you only have a third of a pound you know you can see how that would make sense but these volatilization numbers are astronomically high for most normal situations in turf grass management. 55 to 65% is exceedingly high. So don't let that scare you. Don't let marketing sheets scare you into thinking you're losing half your nitrogen to volatilization. Of course, it's possible, but possible and probable are oftentimes light years apart. Okay. Losses will be m much lower if urea is incorporated in the soil. Now, this night 2007 study. I'm going to go over this night 2007 study, be, uh, but I'm waiting to see if I can get um, one of the authors to come on and, and go over that with me. Basically, what they found in the night 2007 study in these other studies is that a little bit of what you apply urea to turf grass, apply a little bit of water, and volatilization just basically drops to zero almost, almost to insignificant levels. Okay. So, in cases where you're applying urea and there's no irrigation, Okay, and there's no ability to control the water at all. That would not, you know, that uh, these papers would not be useful to you. In other words, you know, they're useful knowing, okay, you put out urea, put out a little bit of water, and you're good. Even, but even in cases where you don't have control of the irrigation, there's still very little evidence that there's going to be a great deal of volatilization in turf grass settings. Okay, a little bit of water, it's you know, basically eliminated for the most practically speaking, the volatilization is zero. Without water, it can increase, it can definitely be an, a factor, but it's still nowhere near in as, as it is in agricultural settings where you're dealing with bare soil. Okay. And this 55 to 65% is, I mean, it did exist in 59. They did measure that, but I wouldn't let that, that's, that's the, that's abnormal. That's not the norm. Okay. Norm is maybe five or ten percent. You know, worst case scenario, maybe twenty percent or something in turf grass settings. And under normal conditions, you're you're just not going to have these very high 50, 60 percent volatilization numbers. Okay. And we'll go over that. Like I said, I'm going to hold off on the night paper for a little bit and see if I can work that out with the with their schedule. One way to reduce the loss of nitrogen from urea is the inhibition of the nitrogen trans transformation that leads to the, those losses, the, the, the volatilization and leaching. The usual approach is to control the activity of urease with inhi inhibitory compounds that delay urea hydrolysis. 
so as to limit the accumulation of ammonium and the rise in pH that allows gaseous loss via ammonia volatilization. Okay. So that's a strategy. Well, ammonia volatilization can only occur from ammonium. So let's, and if we apply urea, it's going to convert to ammonium rapidly within a couple of days. So let's just prolong that conversion from, say, one or two days to some other length of time, a longer period of time, so that it stays in the urea form a little bit longer and reduces the, the volatilization, which in laboratory settings and in the ag settings, that's exactly what happens. It greatly it reduces it by about half. If you're going to have 40% volatilization, you add one of these in there, you're going to have about 20% volatilization. It's going to have a significant reduction, result in a significant decrease in volatilization. That's the concept behind it, and it works in ag. Uh, it, 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 but it, but it does not, or it, it very rarely results in some sort of, uh, secondary benefit to the turf. In other words, I, I care about the volatilization. Yes, but I don't get paid on that. I get paid on the turf. So what does it do to the turf? And when you think about it that way, you remove that red herring and say, okay, well, you're focused on the volatilization. You're losing 50%. You're losing 60%. We've got to reduce that. We've got to reduce that. So you're thinking, thinking, thinking about that. And that's what the marketing sheets want you to do. Think about this and pull your uh, attention away from the product that we're producing. That is turf grass. And when you look at that, there's just not a lot there. Okay. So keep that in mind as we read through here. Stabilized urea fertilizers and commercial formulations that include an inhibitor. Oh, st stabilized urea fertilizers are commercial formulations that include an inhibitor. One such product, Uflex, is marketed specifically for turf grass nitrogen fertilization and contains urea mixed with MBPT for urease inhibition and DCD for the nitrification inhibition. Okay, and there's two other compounds that are commonly used or documented to have a, a beneficial or a, a reduction in volatilization and reduction in nitrification. In Uflex, they use MB, MBPT and DCD. Another inhibitor, Nutrisphere, which there's, an, there's, several, there's several scientific articles that include Nutrisphere. <laughs> okay. We'll probably go over those at some point. But what, notice the way he w words this paragraph. He, wor he words it the way you should word it. And I'm going to make sure in the yellow, I'm going to point it out how they worded this paragraph. Okay. Another inhibitor, Nutrisphere, Nutrisphere is a copolymer. Of maleic acid, or uh, ma malic, or I thought it said acid, maleic and itoconic, I can't even pronounce those words, acids, oh yeah, there it is, occurring as a partial calcium salt for use of a, as a coating to ammoniacal nitrogen fertilizers to inhibit urease nitrification and denitrification. Nutrisphere is a stable water soluble, slowly biodegradable and branched polymer that occurs in 30 to 40 micron, micron le lengths, I guess is what it says. So the, they, this product has been studied thoroughly. And, and if I need to, I'll go into all those articles. But it has basically no impact. <laughs> Even what they say it does, when we just measure that straight up, it has virtually no impact. And there's one or two very good articles by a, research, a researcher in North Dakota, I think, or is it North Dakota or North Dakota, North Dakota State? I can't remember where he's at, uh, where he looked at that. And um, I'll pull that up if necessary. But there's reason I'm saying that because there's only, in turf grass, there's only two compounds that have consistently additives. Okay, we're not talking about coating materials. But two additives to urea that have been confirmed to reduce uh, volatilization and two additives to urea that have come in, been confirmed to reduce nitrification. Okay, and neutrophil is not one of them. Neutrophil is not one of them. All right. The inhib the inhibitory properties of the material. This is neutrophil. Reportedly, arise from its highly negative charge density. For urease inhibition, this extreme anionic charge density is purported <laughs> to sequester the nickel necessary for the urease enzyme to function. Nitrification and denitrification are presumably reduced due, due to ionic binding of any ammonium that may be generated. So this whole thing in yellow is basically the, the scientists, including what the manufacturer claims 
and doing it in a you know observatory language basically this is what they purported this is what it's presumed to do this is what they reported it but it, in other words they don't have any citations citing that the product actually does what it says it might do because it's very rare that there's many many articles that actually show it doesn't do what it says it does and i'll go into that i don't want to get you know in a bind over this i'll go over that if necessary it's not a problem it's in the literature all right, the hypothesis. Under turfgrass management conditions, experimental evidence is lacking that st stabilized fertilizers can improve nitrogen use efficiency or reduce nitrogen losses from the sward, from turfgrass. In this work, we evaluated the effectiveness of Uflex and Nutrisphere under turf management conditions to increase fertilizer nitrogen uptake efficiency and reduce nitrogen loss from the turf. So, pretty straightforward they're going to look at uflex and they're going to look at neutrosphere to see you know how it, how they impact the fertilizer uptake and reduce nitrogen losses from the turf and they look at i think they even look at quality and color in here as well the turf grass the research was conducted at the university of illinois landscape horticultural research center in urbana illinois on a four-year-old mixed stand of kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass maintained at three inch high to cut it's an awful high high to cut for kentucky bluegrass but you got perennial rye in there i guess so okay the experiment was initiated on may 22nd 2010 so about 14 years ago a randomized complete block design was utilized with six replications so six replications is a lot of replications in the field that's a lot of replications anywhere but in the field that's a lot of replications so they only have three three treatments i believe if i'm not mistaken they had three treatments and that's the value of keeping the keeping the questions simple yeah keeping the the study simple is when you keep it simple you can do six replications okay so let's you got three treatments and six replications so you got 18 plots versus some of the other studies i did i went over in the 80s and, and 90s You'll see like 15 treatments in there. Well, 15 treatments and you got four replication or you say you got six replications and you're dealing with a hundred and something plots. That's hard to maintain. And then the power. So let's say you had, so you're not gonna be able to maintain that. So you had, let's say you have 15 treatments and you have four replications. Now you got 60 plots versus three times six is 18. You got six, you know, you're, you're, you're at some point. A, a person, whether it's staff or faculty or students, can only maintain so many plots before it becomes uh, insurmountable. You can't maintain them all. And so, when you're dealing with something like this, it's a simple question. You got three study, you got three treatments. You you rep it six times. You have a very strong study, and you still have a study that you can maintain easily with 18 plots is no problem. Once you get to about the 40 number, 40 to 50 plots, it becomes you, you have to end up end up getting help to maintain them and. It's hard for any one person to maintain a study like that in the field with 40 to 50 plots. So anyway, so they had six, six treatments or six reps. That's a lot of reps, and they, but they only have three treatments, so it's not a problem. Treatments consisted of granular Nutrisphere, Uflex, and urea formulated to commercial specifications and enriched with N15 labeled urea. Oftentimes we get this, in, we get this argument or debate sometimes. We, if we don't use M15 urea, which is expensive and it requires special training and all these other things. And some, so the most of the time we don't use M15 urea. And they'll say, well, you need to, you need to use a, a labeled, a ra a radio labeled nitrogen so you have, you know, know exactly where you came from and all this other stuff. And we do it. I'm like, okay, well, do it. But it doesn't change the results. <laughs> you might have more confidence in the results, but the results are going to be the same. In other words, in this particular study, you'll find that it's, it, it, it correlates very well with past research it doesn't change anything because we use m15 so just because when you hear someone say well i, I know it's what you found but i'm not going to believe it unless we had n15 unless you use n15 labeled urea what i would say is no problem pay the money for the extra for the n15 and i'll do it with n15 labeled urea no problem and then when they see the the, the price on that they're not going to pay for it so we just use regular urea and we're probably going to get the same thing i just think it's funny when i hear that argument it's a horrible argument and but they'll they'll argue, but they're not willing to actually sponsor the research to do it. And they don't even I don't, whatever. I'll move on. Treatments were hand applied into the enclosure. They built an enclosure, so it's very accurate the way they applied it. And treatments were applied 
at one pound of nitrogen. To create conditions conducive to nitrogen loss by volatilization, irrigation was delayed for one day following application. During this period, ammonia volatilization was estimated in the duplicate in duplicate for each plot. So on each plot, they had they measured it twice on the same plot. And they didn't water anything after application to exacerbate volatilization. Leaf tissue analysis was collected weekly. At the conclusion of the study, duplicate di uh, whatever four di four inch is that four inch four inch diameter cores were taken from each plot, and all leaf tissue was removed from the plug using scissors and prepared for total kill. Or so they did nitrogen with to total Keldahl nitrogen. To quantify fertilizer nitrogen in roots and soil. 20 one-inch diameter cores were co collected from the surface, um, 15 centimeter, uh, the surface 15 centimeters, so the top 15 centimeters, I guess, the top 6 inches. Yeah, so, they, so the, roots and the, the roots and soil, yeah, so they're just basically trying to do a mass balance, and they took, they, they, for the roots and the soil, they did that by taking core samples at the end of the study, I guess, is what they, I'm trying to see what they, yeah, okay. Total nitrogen analysis was performed by digesting foliage, roots, and soil. So they did total nitrogen with foliage, roots, and soil by TKN, which is standard. Uh, so when, when we're going to refer to this plant or soil nitrogen-derived fertilizer, they're going to say NDFF, so nitrogen-derived fertilizer. And they're going to have another acronym called Potentially Mineralizable Nitrogen. And that was quantified for soil samples. So remember these acronyms, NDFF and PMN, because I'm going to have to come back to these. I can never remember these, these acronyms. Turf grass color and quality ratings were recorded every seven days after treatment based on a scale of one to nine. And six was the minimum accepted level. It's all standard stuff. All right, so let's get to the results. I'm going to show most of the results in the paper. Then I have one uh, PowerPoint that easily shows the color and quality. La so, but this is pretty much, pretty much easy to read. It's easy to read. It's easy to follow. Some of these articles I go over are not that not easy. I've mentioned that. It's very difficult and it's challenging. This is not one of them. This is very easy to understand exactly what they did and exactly what they found. Losses of applied nitrogen by ammonium, ammonia, by ammonia volatilization were detected for all treatments, but were very limited, ranging from 0 0.01 to 1%. In average, the average was 0.04% of applied nitrogen. And they didn't even show it. They just said data not shown. Losses of this magnitude, so less than 1%, were deemed biologically insignificant, and the data were not subjected to statistical analysis. So in other words, the volatilization was so low, they just said, ah, they scrapped it. <laughs> there was no volatilization. Even under a condition where they attempted to exacerbate volatilization by not applying any irrigation, okay, for the first day, or the day after they applied the, the urea. They let it sit there in an in in environment that should be very conducive to volatilization. So they didn't water it in. And the volatilization was still, on average, only 0.04% of what they applied. So it just there wasn't much volatilization at all. There was a little bit from every treatment, but it was so low that it was deemed insignificant. No significant differences in clipping yields were detected among fertilizer treatments throughout the course of the study. So there was no difference in clipping yields. Okay? All treatments exhibited a rapid increase in turf color and quality following nitrogen fertilization, although no differences in either color or quality were observed throughout the trial. I'm going to show this in a graph. The increase in color and quality occurred until three weeks after application, after which both parameters remained relatively stable for the remainder of the study. No treatment differences were detected for total nitrogen in the shoots throughout the course of the study. So we got no differences on volatilization. We've got, so far, we've got no differences on color. We've got no differences on quality. And we've got no differences on nitrogen in the shoots. But we've got a big difference in the paycheck we had to pay, or the, the, the bill we had to pay when we bought that Uflex. I can tell you that much. Isotopic analysis of total nitrogen digests for the N15 labeled nitrogen showed no significant differences 
for the nit nitrogen derived fertilizer. Is that what it says? Nitrogen derived from fertilizer in the shoots. So even the N15 didn't show there's any differences. Similar, similarly, no treatment differences were observed over the period, the study period, in the fertilizer and nitrogen use efficiency by the shoots. At the conclusion of the study, about 20% of the N15 applied had been recovered in the shoots. That's that's in the ballpark. That's probably a little low. Usually I like to see it around half of what we applied. This is where I am, guys. About half of what we applied around that number is generally a good number to assume. So if we apply a pound over that, as that pound is out there and being taken up by the turf, roughly speaking, we'd have about half of that taken up into the plant. They had 20%. I mean, it's not unheard of, but it might be a little bit on the low end. Okay, for roots, no significant treatment differences were observed at 56 days after treatment in total nitrogen, nitrogen derived from fertilizer or, ni or fertilizer nitrogen use efficiency. And they didn't even show the data because there was no differences in the, in the roots. So <laughs> we, we're batting zero at the moment with, with this study. There's these, the, the inclusion of an extremely expensive nitrogen source compared to urea hasn't given us any return on the money spent yet. Okay, let's keep going. A parallel evaluation for soil plus roots, table three here, re revealed no treatment differences in total nitrogen for the surface three inches or subsurface, say three to, uh, what is that, uh, three to six inches or whatever that is. I can't, I can't do this math in my head very quick. Or in nitrogen derived from fertilizer that was around 1% of the surface layer. So... There's nothing going on there either. <laughs> There's soil plus roots. The last part of the results. No treatment differences were detected in estimating PMN. What is PMN? Potentially mineralizable nitrogen. So no treatment differences were detected in estimating potentially mineralizable nitrogen by the ISNT. I don't know. what. what see, they got all these acronyms. It's too much to handle when you have that many. It takes away from it. Illinois soil nitrogen test. So just by the soil nitrogen test for the surface or subsurface soil samples. So let me start off. No treatment differences were detected in estimating the potentially mineralizable nitrogen at the surface or subsurface at 56 days after treatment. Nor was there any significant treatment effect on mineral nitrogen recovered from these depths as exchangeable ammonium and nitrate or nitrite since no more than trace amounts of labeled were recovered in these nitrogen pools. So I remember yesterday we had this uh, paper where we looked at ammonium and nitrate at these different soil depths and different times. And remember the idea, the mechanism behind these nitrification inhibitors and urease inhibitors, the stabilized nitrogen, is that you'll maintain more nitrogen in the urea form a little bit longer, delay the conversion to ammonium, and then you'll also maintain it in the ammonium form with the addition of DCD delay the conversion of nitrate. So you should have greater quantities of ammonium and less less quantity of nitrate compared to urea. So you, you know in in and uh when for the DCD. So in other words, there should be a difference between ammonium and nitrate in the soil when you use stabilized nitrogen sores compared to when you don't. And what they found is they didn't find that. And the same thing happened yesterday. There was one or two instances there was, was there a, when there was a difference. Sometimes it was, uh, the, the DCD resulted in greater ammonium, which it should. And sometimes it didn't. And actually, sometimes urea resulted in greater ammonium. So it ended up being basically a wash. And probably, you can go back and look at the paper, 80 or 90% of the time, there were no differences at all. The stabilized nitrogen additive provided no impact or no change in the ammonium or nitrate compared to urea. And that's what they found here. There was no differences. Somewhat greater recovery of fertilizer in 15 labeled, nitro 15 -labeled nitrogen occurred in the mi potentially mineralizable nitrogen than in mineral nitrogen. So there was a little bit greater recovery in the potentially mineralizable nitrogen, averaging 0.00. .00 Four percent for the surface soil and 0.0005 percent for the subsurface soil. 
As with mineral nitrogen, these recover these recoveries were deemed biologically insignificant. So if you want to pay eleven hundred dollars a ton for a point zero 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 five percent increase in subsurface potentially mineralizable nitrogen, then go ahead, I guess. That's what they found. They said it was biologically insignificant, which I can clearly I agree with. That's the difference between or that's the importance of recognizing the value of what is statistically significant compared to what is biologically significant. That one could occur while the other doesn't and vice versa. Okay. While there is the discussion, while there is ample evidence that urease and nitrification inhibitors can retard the conversion of urea to nitrogen form subject to loss, the data presented here suggests that inhibitors do not significantly reduce fertilizer nitrogen loss in turf. So if you're listening and you're distracted, listen up to the next sentence. For the multiple parameters evaluated in our work, neither Uflex nor Nutrisphere provided any benefit beyond standard urea. So this is the second or third paper where there's been such a terse comment made. I mean, it's, it's straight to the point. Okay. I mean, there's no benefit. I love it when authors write that stuff. I don't have the nerve or the guts to do that. The courage. I don't have the courage to do that, but I like it when other people do. In, present, in the present study, there were no differences in any measured parameter between unamended and stabilized urea fertilizers. Since the experiment did not include an unfertilized control, no definitive assessment can be made as to the fertilizer nitrogen response. Still, turfgrass fertilizer nitrogen use efficiency did not differ, from, differ among Uflex Nutrisphere and unamended urea, demonstrating comparable nitrogen loss for each treatment and also comparable uptake of unlabeled soil nitrogen. Overall, I, I want to talk about this these graphs, but it seems like I'm skipping it. Overall, approximately 60% of the applied nitrogen could not be accounted for regardless of treatment and begs the question as to why the stabilized products did not have their intended effect on boosting nitrogen efficiency over that of unamended urea. So they're saying, well, why did this happen? Basically, you know, it should have had something, but not, something should have happened, but nothing happened. The low fertility capping material should have increased fertilizer nitrogen response and the excessive rainfall in June was conducive to nitrogen loss. Yet the two stabilized fertilizers performed no better than unamended urea. Let's look at the graphs because I think I'm skipping, skipping them. I don't want to skip through these because I want to make sure I go over them. So here's the clipping yield for those listening. I'm looking at a, a bar chart here. The black, you can't quite see it here, but this black right here is Nutrisphere. The dotted one is Uflex, and then the, the white one is Urea. And we have days after treatment on the x-axis and clipping yields on the y-axis. And you can simply say, yeah, after, that, after they apply the Urea, you can see that the, the, the yield goes up. Clipping yields goes up as the turf grass can, grows. And then in, in you know, two weeks, three weeks, well, after the peak occurred, the peak was there for a couple of weeks, at about three weeks, four weeks, the peak, and then it started to drop off at about seven, uh, no, five weeks. About five weeks out, the, gl the clipping yield began to decline and then stayed, stayed fairly low, okay? And there were no differences between any of these nitrogen sources and clipping yield. There's another graph down here. I'm going to get to the, the, the quality here. This is the leaf tissue nitrogen graph, the same thing where we have Nutrisphere, Uflex, and Urea. And the nitrogen concentrations in the leaf tissue Grams of nitrogen. Okay, so grams of nitrogen. So this is you can just move this decimal over and call it a percent. So four percent was roughly at the beginning, and it stayed at about four percent. And about five, six weeks out, it began to decline, and it declined slowly until about three percent nitrogen in the tissue. And all of them were the same. All the nitrogen sources, Nutrisphere and Uflex and Urea, were the same. Not only statistically, but biologically, there was no difference between these two, or between those three. And then this is the fertilizer in uptake efficiency of leaf tissue over the course of the experimental period. This is the percent uptake here. And I just want to point out that the sum of the percent uptake, remember they said it's about 20%. And between Nutrisphere, Uflex, and Urea, you can see all of them are at 20%. That's just what I wanted to point out there. Now, what I want to do is I want to go to this. Uh, uh, this let me go to this first. And what I want to do is go to the PowerPoint. I want to show the quality on this slide here. So we're looking at the same data. There was a, there was a table in there that was um, 
oriented in an odd fashion. So I just put the data onto this uh, this PowerPoint figure here. And we're looking at a line graph with days of treatment on the x-axis and turf grass color from 1 to 9 on the y-axis. And the, the, the x-axis days of treatment goes from 7, so 1 week, 7 days, out to about 8 weeks. Okay. We have Nutrisphere, Uflex, Urea, and, the min and then we have the red line being minimal acceptable. Remember the red line, anything ab um, above this red line is going to be deemed acceptable by, by the, review, by the uh, researchers. And it, we just want to point out there's no differences. There were no differences statistically or biologically on any of these treatments. There's a little bit of a drop here with Uflex at the, four, at the seven week mark, but this is not significant statistically or, or, or biologically. They all were above six after they were below six until about 10 days. But about 10 days after the application, the quality of all these plots were fine. From one pound of uh, nitrogen from urea, Uflex, and Nutrisphere in Urbana, Illinois. Urbana, Illinois. I also want to point out that the longevity, look at the longevity, guys and gals. It went up. This is the way I measured this nitrogen cost study, by the way, that I went over a couple weeks ago. As soon as it goes above this line, I started counting days. And as soon as and it keep going, keep going, keep going. And then when it, and whenever it did go back bo down below that six point line is when I stopped the clock and I counted this total area and total, total uh, length of time. That's how I did that study, by the way, if you guys are interested in that. Uh, anyway, in this study, look, it's urea. It's Uflex and Nutrisphere. And look, one pound of urea lasted it, it, re it resulted in a turf grass quality out to 56 days now it didn't didn't get above the, the point so let's say it didn't get above it until 10 days so let's say 46 days and the quality is still at a seven and that's when they stopped taking the quality rating the or the color ratings so this this is why i've said for many over and over and over is that it's very difficult to financially compete with urea because the the because the turf grass response to urea is much, much longer than most people expect. And, they're, and there's much longer than the, the slow-release fertilizer manufacturers and distributors will tell you. They'll say, if they say, hey, this is a slow-release SCU or slow-release polymer coat or whatever, and it's going to last you know, 45 days or 60 days, well, the urea right here lasted 46 days, and it was still going. It was just straight urea at one pound. Okay. So what am I going to get by spending more money on a polymer coat or a reacted or a natural organic or whatever? And they may have an answer for that. What I would say, I just haven't seen it in the literature that consistently. There are cases clearly where I can show you where there is some additional longevity, but it's not going to be anywhere remotely close to offsetting the cost. Okay. Now let's go back to the PowerPoint. We're going to look at quality. This was color. Now we look at quality, and with the quality is essentially the same. There's a little bit of a, a drop here at the end, but that wasn't significant between these nitrogen sources. All this was statistically the same. They it was the same as color, basically. It went, went up above quality line at 10 days, and it was still above quality out to 56 days after application. Okay, so when we you know when we step back away from the indoctrination and the marketing schemes and all these you know all this stuff that they they throw at you when you step back away and look at it and go well i you know i if, or if we don't do that and we say well yeah I want, I want my nitrogen to last you know whatever 60 days or 90 days i want that i want it to last that long well yeah that sounds good in theory it sounds good but i don't think you really care about that I think what you care about is the turf grass response to that nitrogen source. I mean, when I say it like that, everybody's going to say, yes, well, duh, we get that, Travis. But oftentimes we lose sight of it. We, they, they like to use these red herrings to distract us away from our, our vision and our goal. This nitrogen source should last, you know, 90 days. Well, show me how it competes against urea. Because urea is lasting a lot longer than, than what you might expect, okay? Let's go back to the power or the uh, PDF. That's all I wanted to show you on the on the PowerPoint. And okay, where did I go here? I'm on the where I left off. Oh, I left off right here. Okay, 
and so that that quality and color was this this uh for those watching it was this table here that's oriented landscape wise so it's hard to read so i put it on that that figure the beneficial effect of uflex and neutrosphere in reducing volatilization of urea nitrogen was expected based on the previous field studies demonstrating the effectiveness of mbpt and the neutrosphere copolymer for this purpose i didn't expect it <laughs> just so you know <laughs> to increase the potential for liberation of ammonia Urea hydrolysis was allowed to occur on the soil surface by delaying irrigation for 24 hours after fertilizing. Yet surprisingly, ammonia volatilization during this period was negligible, even with the unamended urea. This finding is inconsistent with previous reports of substantial ammonia loss from fertilized turf. But soil differences probably account for the disparity between their study and some other study. So they're saying in the past, historically, in the literature, you'll find some volatilization. They didn't. So it is what it is. Let's go to the next paragraph down or the the next little section here. The ineffectiveness of Uflex as reported herein is in contrast to the findings of Jew in 87. Now this Jew paper in 87 is one paper. There's about three papers by Nick Christensen's program in the late 80s, early 90s that have some information in there about a beneficial response by using the stabilized nitrogen sources. And I'll get into those. Like I said in the previous uh, episode, I'm showing this side of the story, and then I'll show some that there is some benefit. Okay, I don't think that's a substantial, uh, uh, an enough of a benefit to offset the cost, but there is something there in one or two studies. Well, I think I think there's actually three studies. Uh, but that same program published another paper where there wasn't a benefit, and you'll see, you'll see many, many more papers indicating that very rarely is there ever going to be a beneficial response to the turf grass by using stabilized nitrogen sources. And I don't know of one study that has shown a response large enough to offset the additional cost of using stabilized nitrogen sources compared to just using straight urea. It may exist. I'm just not familiar with it. So the Jew paper in 1987, uh, Contrast, they had reports that contrasted this work on Kentucky bluegrass with unlabeled urea and differing, differing enrichments of MBPT, so they were using different rates. Their results showed an increase in clipping yields with the inhibitor that ranged from 20 to 27% and was greatest during the summer when hot weather would have promoted ammonia volatilization. In a study of perennial ryegrass, Watson in 1990 used MBPT and led to a 20% increase in, in, in recovery estimated by the difference method and 8.8 percent higher dry matter yield seven weeks after a single application of urea that was supplied two pounds of nitrogen so there were some studies saying there were some studies that showed the benefit mosdell in 87 or 86 I, we, we went over this paper i believe the mosdell 86 paper evaluated the effectiveness of dcd in reducing a urea nitrogen conversions to nitrate in a field study with kentucky bluegrass and concluded that the dcd was effect was effective for such a short period that its use would seldom be justified for turf grass. Yeah, we did go over that paper and look back a day or two. And we, it was one of those papers that we went over. Waddington in 89 came to a similar conclusion that DCD is of no value for increasing fertilizer nitrogen use efficiency in turf unless applied at an unrealistically excessive rate. And I think we went over the Waddington paper too, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I need to zoom this out. Okay, no color or quality response was observed in our work with Uflex and Nutrisphere relative to the use of unamended urea. This finding is consistent with previous research by Mosdell in 86, documenting no positive effect of DCD to turf grass color and quality. Similarly, the lack of turf response to Nutrisphere in the present study leads to the same conclusion reached by Mosdell in 86 in regard to DCD, so nothing happened. So it was saying some studies showed something different, some studies showed something similar to what we found, and we found what we found. Now we're going to go to the last little part here and then we're done. With and without inhibition, there was very little fertilizer nitrogen recovery in the soil nitrogen pool study. For total soil nitrogen recovery of N15 labeled nitrogen was greater in the surface than in the subsurface layer, okay? There was no effect of inhibition on potentially mineralizable nitrogen estimated by this nitrogen soil test. And the only and only trace N15 recovered was in this fraction, regardless of whether urea, uflex, or neutrosphere had been applied, that's what we mentioned, is that there's such a small amount that they recovered, it was they didn't even show the data. So there's some things in red here that I'm going to read, which is the reason why I picked this paper. 
this this last little bit here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum this up here. And we're going to be done here shortly. But listen up because these last couple of sentences are great. I love these. I love this stuff. At the conclusion of the eight week study, the inhibitors proved to be of no value for decreasing nitrate concentrations relative to unamended urea. <laughs> There's no value. I love that. Similar findings have been reported from previous studies with Kentucky bluegrass. I already mentioned all that stuff. Okay. Uh, Waddington in 89 repeatedly applied DCD during a three year study that involved periodic samplings of soil organic nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen, sorry. But of, of 56 evaluations, there were only five that showed an elevated ammonium and three were reduced nitrate level. I think that's the one we went over. I talked about sometimes it increased it, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes the other one increased it when it shouldn't have. Regardless of fertilizer treatments, inorganic soil nitrogen accounted for only trace recoveries of N15 in the present study. So here's the last sentence in red. So listen up. <laughs> I haven't ever heard a, a conclusion worded this way. I don't know these authors. Let me see. Mulvaney and Brown, maybe I've heard those names. I don't know if I've ever met them. I'm going to have to shake their hand next time I see them. <laughs> I just like the way they worded this. The total lack of significant treatment differences for every parameter studied leads us to conclude that the urease and nitrification inhibitors used were of no value for reducing nitrogen loss of urea nitrogen applied to turf grass and did not offer any advantages over unamended urea. I can, I can barely say that sentence without laughing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I love that. In one respect, however, this conclusion must be qualified since the study site was managed under irrigation and thus volatilization losses may have been reduced. Under irrigated turf conditions, Little, if any, advantage can be expected from the use of urease inhibitor. So they can they qualify the end there with their with their statement at the end. So they didn't irrigate it at the beginning um, to allow for volatilization, but they, that they did irrigate it following that. So under those conditions, they found a, a total lack of significant differences, and this is of no value whatsoever. That's firm language. That's really firm language. So. Anyway, that's, that's the, the, the Henny, Branham, and Mulvaney study from 2013. So in the short, they did a study in Illinois with N15 labeled nitrogen. They looked at so soil nitrogen. They looked at plant nitrogen. They looked at plant response. And they found nothing. You know, they found no advantage, no beneficial effect from using stabilized nitrogen compared to just using straight urea. And to make matters worse, to make the argument even worse for the stabilized nitrogen sources, let's say they had a beneficial impact. Let's say the quality went from seven to, I don't know, eight or something. Let's say that, let's say that happened. That's, that's still, in my view, not a very strong position to hold if you're going to try to offset the additional cost. Like I've said before, you can go back to the cost paper. The cost of this at the time in 2000, when was it, 20 or 2020 or 21, I can't remember. The cost of this was 1150 a ton compared to urea at 635 a ton. And don't quote me on that. So come back and, or go read that article. I, I may be wrong on those exact numbers. But it was double to use a stabilized nitrogen source compared to urea. So if you want to pay double for your urea source, to gain a half a unit, and well, we didn't find a half a unit quality, but let's say you did. Let's say you did see a full unit from seven to eight. They're all acceptable. All the turf grass is acceptable, but you're going to get a little bit deeper color using a nitrogen source that cost $1,150 a ton compared to $635 a ton. Do you want to pay for that return? That's up to you. I wouldn't. I would never apply Uflex or Umax or any stabilized nitrogen on my property ever. I don't see the point in it. But when there is, which is extremely rare, I don't even know if there is a case where it resulted in greater quality. But if, if even if it did occur, you'd have to look at it and go, okay, well, do I really want to pay that much money to get that additional increase? That's, that'd be up to you. And we just don't see that. The longevity from my paper last week didn't show that Uflex resulted in any greater longevity of acceptable turf. 
It didn't show that urea or Uflex resulted in any greater increase in quality compared to urea. The stabilized nitrogen sources just didn't provide any additional longevity or any additional magnitude of response from that paper. And, they, and then the paper on Monday basically said the same thing. The paper yesterday said the same thing. The paper today says the same thing. You're not seeing any additional longevity. You're not seeing any additional magnitude of increase. You're not seeing any additional uptake of nitrogen in the leaf tissue, you know, increase in yields. You're not, we're just not seeing that. And you're paying a lot for that. But even if you did see that, you would have to balance that out and go, okay, do I really want to pay that much more money to get that increase? And that's what we're going to find in some of the Jew papers where they do show an increase. There, there was a increase in yield. I think there was even an increase in quality. I haven't read those papers in a little while. But there was a beneficial impact by using stabilized nitrogen sources. And I'll show that. Keep that in mind is that, yes, there's a difference. There's a, there's a benefit. Do you want to pay that much money to get it? That's up to you. Okay, guys. Uh, any questions before I go? Half-Life Lawn. Thank you for doing this. This industry and others desperately need scientific direction. So I think, well, you're welcome. Very welcome. I'm glad to do it. Keep in mind, I think it was Abraham Lincoln actually started the land-grant institution system thing. And I think every state has a, well, I know every state has a land-grant institution. I think it was 1862 or 1863. I can't remember. And some of them even have two land-grant institutions. And so there's a lot of people out there that are willing to help. I don't know if you feel comfortable contacting them or not. Maybe you just feel comfortable listening to YouTube. That's fine, whatever. But keep in mind that many, many professional scientists are available to help you. They just may be busy doing other things and sitting in front of a camera and talking to YouTube. But, <laughs> but um, I'm just one. And I'm retired. I don't even do much anymore. I do a little bit of you know, goofy research on the side. That's about it. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Tierman. Uh, it's hard for me to read that on the screen. Sorry. What nitrogen source is best in soil temps below 55? Well, if the, if, well, that's going to depend, but below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, I wouldn't be putting out a whole lot of nitrogen. There. In other words, I'm, I'm thinking when you say that, I'm thinking the turf grass is going into the winter. It's going from fall to winter. If that's the case and the, and the soil temperatures are going down, the turf grass is going down in terms of its growth and color, then I wouldn't be applying hardly any nitrogen because it's going into dormancy in the winter. Now, on the flip side, we're going into this, going, about to be coming into the spring in a month, and the temperatures are going up where it's going to be going from below 55 degrees to above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, the soil temperatures are moving up and the turf grass is coming out of dormancy. Then that's another situation. So in one, one situation, I wouldn't be applying any nitrogen as you're moving below it, but as you're moving above it and the turf starts to grow, then I would be considering applying nitrogen. And in most cases, it's going to be urea. Okay. Louis Castellu Castellucci, you're going to be using urea this season for the first time. Okay, good. Well, we'll see how it goes. I guess I'm going to have egg on my face if everybody goes out and starts applying it and there's problems. Don't forget, you know, if you apply something and you don't see a response or you apply something and you do see a response, it does not necessarily mean it was from that. Okay, we want to be careful. Just like the Super Bowl field a couple of year, year ago. Oh, uh, it was a disaster and, and the, the turf grass is horrible. No, it just happened to be that they used that specific turf grass that year and the conditions were right and they had a problem, but it wasn't due to that. But they connected the two because it, you know, the rooster crows and the sun comes up. Therefore, the rooster causes the sun to come up. So be careful about connecting too many things. Okay. You know, I have a great deal of confidence that you'll be just fine, but it may be some strange situation comes up and the turf grass would have performed good anyway without the urea. Or the turf grass would have performed poorly even with the urea. So you just want to be um, a little bit aware that the conditions oftentimes dictate what will happen to the turf grass, the water, the light, and the temperature. Don't forget those things, those three will have a greater impact on your turf grass than anything you apply to it, really, other than if you're going to kill it, you know, you're going to spray non selective on it or something like that. But in general, the water, light, and the temperature are what run the show. Okay, guys, um, 
I'm gonna go. I won't be back tonight. I'm I'm gonna have a have a dinner date with my wife. And I don't know if I'm gonna be on this week. I have not got any communication from the other author about maybe coming on this week. So if I'm not on if I'm on this week, it'll be Thursday or Friday. But if I'm not on, then I'll see you back again on Monday. And before I go, before before I forgot to tell you guys, I'm gonna leave you guys with a song that was sang by probably the most well one of the the greatest country music singers of all time don't hang up yet okay just because i said country music okay but to me he was one of the greatest country music singers i'm not a country music fan at all but to me the greatest song that he ever sung was written in 1967 and it has nothing to do with country music at all it was written by somebody else they performed it and their performance is now known as the the performance of this particular song so i hope you enjoy it i'll maybe see you thursday or friday if not it'll be monday until then everybody have a nice uh, week and be kind and i'll see you next time